All right, so I'm now going to talk about Bitcoin wallet security. And I was also asked to talk about key management and hardware security modules and a bunch of other topics all in one talk. Uh, this is going to be a bit broader than some of the other talks because this is a kind of an important subject about how do you actually store Bitcoin and then some of the developments around the actual storage of Bitcoin in a secure way. Um, some that have been integrated into Bitcoin Core, some that have not, things like that. Uh, who am I? We went over this. If you don't remember me, tough. Um, uh, so I was previously working at LedgerX. I was their Bitcoin developer and LedgerX is a CFTC regulated uh, Bitcoin options exchange and clearinghouse. So they uh, have to actually take possession of the Bitcoin um, that are used for the options trades and store them long term. And the Bitcoin absolutely must be there for the settlements and the withdrawals that eventually occur. Um, if they're not, then the whole the whole idea of a clearinghouse, um, you know, what's the point? Uh, so just some really brief lessons learned here. Um, so when you have a, a security situation that, that is just a uh, really has to be done right. Uh, automation is really useful uh, to make sure that everything works and everything is right, get it tested. Um, it's great to have automation, then, then you don't have to do it anymore. But there's actually a high cost to doing automation. And sometimes for high security situations, maybe automation isn't the right option. Uh, so that was, that was one of the lessons that I uh, came away with. Um, also, uh, there's actually no end-to-end -end, um, off-the-shelf storage custody Bitcoin solution for institutions, really. It's not just uh, use Bitcoin Core and you're good to go. You have to actually, like, if you have people in your organization that, are, that don't know how to use Bitcoin, they have to be trained to use Bitcoin and things like that. And just, uh, oh, just download Bitcoin Core isn't uh, sufficient instructions for normies. Uh, and then also, uh, if you're working with regulators to get a license exchange, for example, then uh, be careful what you tell regulators because some of those will be interpreted as promises or design specifications. And then that puts further constraints on the actual uh, shape or structure of, the, of what you can actually build. Um, so as, as an example, one of the consequences of, of certain I mean, uh, representations that were made to regulators, that they were not wrong representations, but... As a consequence of them, though, um, I had to write a lot of custom wallet software that didn't previously exist. Um, and, and honestly, I mean, like, um, the hardware integration for Bitcoin Core um, is still in development and forthcoming, so it's not like there's ready-made solutions anyway. So when we talk about storing Bitcoin, uh, some of this is going to be a little obvious to, to the old timers here, but um, in case you're not aware, uh, you can have things such as hot wallet versus cold wallet. And then you can also have different ways of storing the keys for your wallets, um, most notably online or offline. Um, some companies that store Bitcoin on behalf of users uh, have chosen to use hot wallets, which is basically press a button and you can steal the Bitcoin. Um, and then others have uh, chosen to do like offline storage. Um, so offline storage can work in a number of different ways. One is that you can have uh, something as, as trivial as writing down your seed on a piece of paper and only loading it up onto a computer that is air-gapped, never connected to the internet, to other things where you perhaps have it stored on a computer or a hardware device that is never connected to the internet, but it's not on paper. Uh, some people will find it ironic that one of the major suggestions used to be uh, for Bitcoin users that if you're storing Bitcoin, store it on a paper wallet and put it in a vault. And this, this is contrasted to the fact that, you know, Bitcoin is very software intensive. So you, the fact that paper was a major recommendation was a bit ironic. Okay. And then there's also specialty purpose specific devices such as hardware wallets and hardware security modules, which I'll talk about more later. And then um, there's also certain groups of people that have decided to like build bunkers underground and hire security forces to protect Bitcoin and for long-term storage. And, uh, you know, in some cases, um, it's really interesting because software can sometimes provide a lot of the advantages that hardware could provide or that armed security forces could provide if you're just smarter about how you do it in software. So there's a bunch of different areas to explore here. Um, I was actually um, giving um, a custody talk at uh, Baltic Honey Badger recently in Latvia. And... Um, you know, one of the important things to ask, though, is like, what, what is the actually appropriate 
level of security for different use cases. Uh, not everyone needs that armed security forces. Or not everyone needs to, um, you know, use Shamir secret sharing to back up multiple keys or whatever and pass them on to like your heirs and and um, whoever owns your estate when you die. Um, and then other people will do feel that's appropriate. Uh, so it's, so it's good to be aware of the the different spectrum and different options available for storing your Bitcoin. Uh, and in particular, the reason why I mentioned hairs is that in the event of of your of your death, you know, if you want people in your family to be able to access your Bitcoin, or in the event of a company that has uh, business continuity interruptions, uh, the instructions need to be extremely clear and very very well tested. Um, speaking of testing, I mean, many people don't realize this, but um, uh, anytime you're doing anything in Bitcoin, including transactions or, or long-term cold storage or whatever it is you want to do, you can always test on reg test first. Anytime I spend Bitcoin, I try to uh, test a transaction on reg test first in an environment that I control to verify that my steps are actually correct. I think everyone should be doing that, even though I, know, I recognize it's a lot of friction, but uh, with money, you want to make sure you get it right. So get it right. Um, one way to get things right, though, is uh, checklists, and then have checklists about doing checklists and further checklists and meta checklists. Um, so by that, I mean, like, what are the actual steps that you have planned to do for using your Bitcoin or, you know, if you're advising a company, you know, how are they using and accessing their Bitcoin? There needs to be actual steps documented. Um, so for certain scenarios um, in companies or, or even individually, um, the way I like to think about it is um, something called uh, the signing ritual or signing ceremonies. And this is usually where you have a dedicated room or different rooms in different buildings around the world that are specifically constructed for uh, signing Bitcoin transactions. Um, I'm about to give an example actually on the next slide is the um, DNS -like signing ceremony is probably the most public and most transparent one. It's definitely inspirational and probably the most entertaining video on the internet. It's four hours of people reading off checklists. I, it's really entertaining. Um, but no, it's a great example though. Um, I think uh, it's kind of interesting that there isn't one for this for um, anyone doing their uh, Bitcoin rituals. Like no one has uh, done a transparency video about how they actually store their coins or withdraw them. I think that's really interesting. Um, uh, another idea that was uh, mentioned to me uh, just today was um, the idea with a uh, signing ritual. Um, uh, it would be interesting to try and considering a situation where instead of having software uh, sign your transactions, uh, consider doing it by hand. Um, I think the computationally feasible step in there is um, manually hashing everything. I think that if you use a computer for that step, uh, you might be able to get away with actually manually signing transactions, in which case you might not need computers to touch it, and then you know you can get away with uh, you know not having to check for malware on any of your devices. Uh, okay, so if you were to actually design a signing ritual, what would actually go into that? How would that actually look? Um, so hardware wallets are something on the market. There's a few available. Um, something nice to have is that if you have a hardware wallet, which is a specialty device designed to store Bitcoin, uh, screen on the device would be really useful because then whenever you're about to perform some action, the device can tell you what it thinks you're about to do. Um, one way that this could be particularly useful is um, if you're signing a series of transactions, perhaps you can uh, unlock the device solely for the hash of the list of transactions and only for transactions that are in that list. And that way the hardware wallet can't be used to sign other details during the unlocking period. Um, the idea of unlocking a hardware wallet, it actually kind of terrifies me. This idea of like a locked mode and an unlocked mode just seems kind of wrong because uh, the idea of security is that you want the security to always be on, not just like enable security and disable security while you're doing stuff. But uh, have lots of backups. That's a good idea. Um, oh, um, one of the one of the nice to haves that everyone has been talking about for a long time, but it hasn't been made yet. Maybe one of you can do it. Is the idea of uh, running a Bitcoin Core node on a hardware wallet of some kind, and so that the consensus rules can be verified in the hardware wallet. Um, there's an upcoming slide where I discuss this as uh, useful for a Lightning Network, for example, where you can have a node, a Lightning node running. 
uh, such that transactions are only signed in the event that they positively increase your balance or something. And then the hardware device would be able to verify those rules and monitor blockchain data to confirm that. Um, so there's another sector of the market uh, that has been called hardware security modules, and this has existed uh, long before Bitcoin hardware wallets and Bitcoin itself. And I actually think that um, the idea of uh, separating hardware wallets and hardware security modules is actually a bit antiquated, and we shouldn't do it anymore. We should just call them all hardware wallets or call them all, all uh, hardware security modules. Uh, but they're generally seen as having more computational power. Um, but, but again, though, I mean, I, like from the perspective of selling equipment to people or providing equipment and security, does it really make sense to have um, like some customer demographic having better security or more features than others? Like we all have the same requirements for the most part for securing our Bitcoin. So I'm not really sure that um, fragmenting the market makes sense. Uh, okay, so I've already talked about this, this use case for Lightning. Um, for, for hardware wallets that only sign transactions that positively increase the balance of the, of the user. Um, this would be useful for like hot, hot wallets that are online but still using hardware security features. Uh, another idea is that you can have a hardware wallet that is uh, itself protected by several other hardware devices, not necessarily hardware wallets. But um, in particular, you can imagine a scenario where you use multi-sig on a cryptography level, not on the Bitcoin level, to gate access to a hardware device. So you have to have a quorum available in order to um, activate the HS HSM. Uh, one of the advantages of this actually is that if you have a number of people that you have entrusted to participate in this process, and perhaps they become uh, irresponsible or unavailable, uh, you could replace them without actually having to rotate your keys on the blockchain. Oh man, key rotation. I haven't even talked about key rotation. Uh, in theory, everyone should be rotating their keys quite regularly because you never know when someone has stolen your private key. Uh, and key rotation on the, on the Bitcoin blockchain side is, uh, has a cost. It has a fee associated with it. But if you have this multi-sig quorum stuff going on to access your Bitcoin or control it, then... Uh, uh, this is one way of minimizing costs while also improving your security situation. Okay, so now let's get down to like Bitcoin specific stuff. Um, I think there's actually a talk right after mine about partially assigned Bitcoin transactions. Uh, so anyway, the idea of this is that uh, you can have a standardized serialization format to communicate with hardware wallets. Um, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, so I'm just going to skip the rest of that. Um, Another way, uh, another, another thing to consider for hardware wallets is uh, pre-signed transactions. Um, if you consider that there is a high cost to actually accessing a hardware wallet or using it regularly, then one interesting thing that you can do is you can uh, pre-sign transactions that are valid that you perhaps store somewhere else or encrypt them somewhere else and you keep the decryption keys wherever. And then in the event of like an emergency or some other situation, perhaps you lose your keys or access to your keys or your hardware wallet, you can sign, um, excuse me, you can broadcast these pre-signed transactions. Uh, there was also a proposal a while back. Um, apparently this was actually not proposed by Bob. Um, Bob informed me that it was not his idea. Um, but anyway, if you wanted to have uh, something like a vault, one idea that has been proposed is using a covenant but Bitcoin doesn't have covenants yet, or at least we certainly hope it doesn't. And I don't think anyone knows whether it really does right now. Um, but anyway, what you can do though is um, uh, with time lock transactions, um, you always have this concern that perhaps someone could steal the key that signed a time lock transaction and instead sign a transaction that does not have time lock. So what you can do instead is send it to a pub key. Um, and then, uh, well, before you do that, you, you can sign a transaction that um, spins from this pub key that you've invented, um, and then you can delete the transaction that pay, uh, excuse me, delete the private key once a transaction spins to it. And this is a way to make it uh, a permanent time lock that uh, must uh, be exhausted before the Bitcoin can be spent. So this is an interesting um, thing you can add to any way of storing Bitcoin to improve security. 
Uh, also, um, I am assisting with a custody workshop that will be occurring in San Francisco sometime in November. Uh, it's smartcustody.com, uh, ran by Christopher Allen and a few others. It's just a one-day workshop for um, family offices. Um, so what would be really nice if there was some sort of um, toolkit for how to store Bitcoin in a really rigorous fashion uh, where you can also share documentation and like video documentation with other people uh, about how to actually participate and use this and actually have like training and and so on. Um, one of the interesting things about um, BIP32 that was briefly mentioned in the last talk is that when you have the public keys, um, you can derive more public keys and more addresses without actually having to go back to your private key. You don't have to do any computation with the private key after you get your public key. And this is really useful, and this actually minimizes the amount of times that you have to interact with your secure hardware elements. Um, so uh, using BIP32 and, and many of these um, many of these hardware wallet solutions uh, can be really useful. Um, so speaking of keys, we've been talking about keys for hours today. Um, something to consider is that if you've never done it before, or even if you have, perhaps uh, participate in like some key signing, um, just ask around maybe in, particularly in Slack would be a good way to do it. Uh, if you have a PGP key that has or has not been signed before, I'm sure there are many people here, including myself, who would be happy to, to sign it. Um, and there's some documentation at the link for, for how this usually goes. Uh, but this is useful for a web of trust. Um, and that's, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, any questions? I, I actually have not evaluated Casa Hoddle's um, solutions yet, but I think they released a lightning node, a hardware lightning node, yeah. I assume it might work, maybe. <laughs> I have a question about um, when you were working at Ledger X, um, you were speaking about uh, X pubs and like extended public keys and deriving keys and stuff like that. Um, what do you think about the security of those X pubs? Like for instance, if, if we had a super secure private key and then we took the X pub and put it on the server to automatically generate addresses for users to deposit in and someone hacked our server and put their X pub there, you know, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Uh, so what do you think about securing the online X pubs? Well, so, so there's some interesting things that you can do here. Um, so more specifically, there have been situations where exchanges have been hacked and deposit addresses have been switched out to the attacker's deposit address. Um, Kraken and at least one other exchange uses uh, PGP signed email receipts. Um, and I don't know if Kraken does this specifically for deposit addresses, but the idea is that if you request a deposit address, they should email you something um, instead of going through the web, because most attackers would assume that they should just compromise the website and not also email. Um, and there's a few other reasons for that, but also it's like PGP signed email as well, so that you can verify that it was actually sent by them. Uh, but then you could say, well, what if the attacker compromises their email sending component as well? Um, I mean, one trivial thing that you could do is just uh, communicate to them over another channel in the beginning and pre-commit to saying these are our Bitcoin addresses. Um, then there are also multi-sig things you can do where um, some Bitcoin exchanges are uh, trying to not have custody, so they try to get the, the users to like have like an escrow participant in a multi-sig setup. Um, and then you can do, do things like um, uh, 202 multi-sig or something, and like, the escrow agent has to sign off on the transaction or whatever. And then, um, you know, then the escrow agent is an additional check on whether the address is correct or something. Um, yeah, things like that can improve the situation. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks.